This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. and Juliet, even though it was the 16th century, I believe, written in this opera, written in 1867, and we're doing it in 2010. So much of it absolutely fits what we are living today, and many of the things that are uttered um, gives me pause, give me pause because I think, my goodness, we're, we're considering those same very questions. We're fighting those same very battles. We need to learn the same lessons. I'm certainly not trying to do the play in any way, but I know visually and sort of in terms of acting what makes a lot of sense. You know, like I can only own what I know and what I what I what pleases me yeah. artistically. So what I just need to make sure is that you guys are game for that. You know, because I, I the opera's textually close to the play in some ways, and in some ways it's its own unique thing. It's unusual in opera to actually approach the text from a dramaturgical point of view and uh, because dramaturgy has been always a big part of my work as an artist because I have such a background in new works that um, that, that was just something that I uh, instinctively went to and what I think was great about doing that was that I was able to really uncover um, some details about characters. There are certain things I think that because this opera and quite frankly this play are sort of in the canon of things that are done again and again that um, assumptions are sort of like this is the way it's done and I really wanted to go back and examine in the most sort of thorough way that I could what um, really who those characters were. Gertrude's response is uh, oh well it's like watching your own child die it's exactly what it must be like I think that when she goes down when she goes down and Capulet's holding her if you can just sink to the ground and if you can reach to touch her, it's just her leg or something, but that you're connected to her still. Singers come to a rehearsal not just knowing a show, but also probably having done it several times. So, so sometimes, you know, they, they're used to doing things a certain way, and, um, and part of what I think, you know, I offer into this process is asking what if we tried something new? What if we tried something different? What if we, I know this is the way it's always done, but just like you know, the way I was interested in exploring characters, I'm also very interested in, in giving an audience an opportunity to see a classic work with fresh eyes, even if it's contextualized in a, in a very traditional context. And you're still no time, and so. One of the most important collaborations in this process has obviously been with um, San Diego Opera's conductor in residence, Karen Keltner. And I found in Karen not just you know someone who is uh, who is curious and game to try some new things with this piece, but also, and I think more importantly, she she really is an expert in so many ways on French opera. To have that kind of input and time to work with uh, to work with a conductor was such a gift. I believe that the music in Romeo and Juliet is quintessentially French and it exhibits that French quality first and foremost probably by its sense of moderation 
and um, economy of means and of statement and of um, just a quite consistent nobility and elegance throughout uh, the score. <laughs> Our cast for Romeo is a young cast, um, and it makes the opera very credible. A couple of us are now the senior members of the, of the equipe of the team, as it should be. Um, and certainly the Romeo and Juliet, who um, are supposed to, in the Shakespeare, obviously, and the Gounod, to be young, are young, and, and visually they are exceedingly young. Um, um, Eileen just exemplifies to my eye with her energy and her her uh, innocence and the way she moves physically she just exemplifies what one would expect Juliet to be as a young young girl <laughs> hear Juliet and um, we, we get this really vibrant key of like D major and G major which is really happy sounding and then you get her first aria where she's really out of breath and just saying how she wants to live in the dream the dream being you know her youth she just she's only heard of love but she wants to really live it and she doesn't want to be it, she even doesn't truly want to be in love she says I just want to live in the dream about it and explore it Once she's singing a duet um, with Romeo, um, he, he actually starts his line and then he sings this gorgeous lilting minuet and sort of brings her into this lyricism and then they sort of tete-a-tete to each other. They just uh, one, one up each other in the lines until he really cuts to her and she kind of gets embarrassed. And then um, vocally by the end you get this range of it's, it's a more complex kind of um, modulation. It's not really clearly major, it's not clearly minor. It's just blissful, but lyric, and really every word has its own note. And it's very, it's just more, it's, just, it's a smoother line, and it arches more. <laughs>
Renault does a great job of not only showing the emotions and the, <clears throat> the interactions between them and their feelings, but also at, at first entrances. Like, I mean, for instance, when, when he first, when Romeo first sees Juliet, there's, there's all this commotion going on with the guys and then bang, it stops. And it's almost like there's like a tremolo in the in the orchestra, but not but not of 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 I would say it wasn't I wouldn't say a like a morning tremolo. It's like it's like almost like a like you could see like the the sky open and and, and the heavens come down. He almost paints that there, and and it's just it's gorgeous. And you kind of just listening to the music, you can feel that first that f almost like a movie esque shot of of him and her. <clears throat> His music is 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 difficult. I mean, because he sings constantly throughout the opera, and he starts out very lyric with the balcony scene and his aria alla vitoire sole. And gradually, the music gets a little bigger into the street scene where the music becomes very, very heroic because that's where all the 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 death and the action and his and his anger and his aggression comes out. dramatically express that with your actions and your text and your voice, it's, it can be a very exhausting thing and an exhausting night. But, you know, it's, if, you, if you just know the text and you know the music, everything else happens on its own. I mean, it just, it guides you to the next step and it, it leads you, you know, it leads you to the right place, it leads you to the right connection. And it's just, it's, it's a great, great score. There's also very few pyrotechnics in, say, the Italian sense of wildness happening orchestrally. There are certainly punctuations and there is a, a surging of tempo forward when it needs to be, but it's always, again, I, I, I repeat myself, uh, but it's always with this sense of moderation and economy and uh, never overstating the case. It makes me think of the music of Frère Laurent because uh, that music particularly has this beautiful basso cantante feeling to it of long phrases, but in a beautiful, beautiful legato line that delivers a text in, in an absolutely moving way, but in a very simple way. <laughs> I particularly like Laurent because it gives me a chance to sing the true French uh, cantabile and show off the, the, that the bass can sing a, a legato as well as sopranos and tenors can. And oftentimes you don't get that opportunity in many operas. The bass is usually the father, or he's the king, or he's the old man, your grandfather, or he's a villain, you know. In this particular case, he's sympathetic, he's friendly, He's nice, and the music reflects that, and it gives me a chance to kind of show off the legato singing. I do have a favorite moment when I'm on stage. It's, it's uh, clearly the moment where I offer her the potion, 
because it become, the music becomes uh, ethereal, almost magical. Certainly the rest of the group is very well matched, very well suited. No one stands out as a, an anomaly in a, in a cast that's otherwise well um, aged grouped. And so it's, it's, it's a lovely group of people to work with and a very talented group. One of the things that was really important to me in the story was that the world of this story had a lots of examples of human behavior. It's like Juliet's quinceanera, okay? It's her, it's her, it's her big girl party, right? And uh, so, her, so everybody's got a mask on or everybody's putting a mask on and, and everybody's, everybody is learning this dance. It, it's like the 13th century version of the Macarena, basically is what it is, okay? That, that you know, the idea, the idea that all the Capulets are going to dance as, as part of this celebration for Juliet's party and that everyone is, is there to wish her well and to welcome her into, into the grown-up world. So the, so the dancers are actually members of the Capulet family. They're not hired dancers. They're not people that we brought in for something. They're really, you know, they're the older teenagers who know the cool dances. And other hand behind the back, here we go. Step together, step, kick and a walk, and a walk, and a walk. Jerk. <laughs> That's an exception, yes. Hey, um. <laughs> beautiful dancers who are who are making the crux of the dance happen within this party sequence in the first act. Um, but around them I have eight chorus, eight core chorus dancers who come out and do the Gaillard with them, and do a, a, a version of the Gaillard with the dancers. One, two, three, two. It's been, a, a, again, a very much a layering process to put together the dancer's dance, which is, of course, the, the most difficult physically, the um, chorus Gaillard, which is a little simpler, but still uh, quite a bit of movement, and I'm, I'm very pleased, I'm very proud of them. I think they're doing a, a tremendous job with it. And then to get everybody else standing up and doing some movement as well. It makes, it brings the party to life. <laughs> I wanted the madrigal to feel like time was suspended. And I know that generally it's just done with Romeo and Juliet on stage, but, but I really wanted to explore the idea of when you see someone that you fall deeply in love with, time stops. Six and one, two, three and four, five, six. Ladies in, two, three and back, five, six and crossing, two, three, hold, five, six and min, two, Three and four, five, six, and under two, three and four, five, six, and ladies two, three and four, five, six, and under two, three and four, five, six, and walking two, three, 
I put together a piece that I thought had the flavor of Renaissance court dance, um, but at the same time is completely original to, uh, to me and to these dancers and to this piece. In those suspended moments of our lives that you know we all remember back to, our lives are changed forever. And so I wanted to find a way to express that on stage. And so as Katora and I began to develop the ideas for the dance and what that would look like, that was sort of our guiding principle. Same thing with Dale Girard when we did the fights. Um, it was very important that it, the fights obviously have lots of energy, but that, but that they were really character-driven fights. Guys, when you take that half beat there to the front, it gets us right on and it looks really yeah, good. I took a look at the video and that half beat where you're out to the front, thank you for remembering that note. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be confused. The artists themselves, they're very much uh, eager to make this opera and opera uh, competitive in today's industry. And what I mean by that is it's not park and bark. They actually have ideas about the character that go beyond just what they bring to the aria. They have a really good dialogue about who this character is for the arc of the opera and how that then needs to be clearly defined in the fight. I think although we cut the moment with the ladle and yeah. the well, yeah. I think when you move up there, we need to still see you see it and get the idea. Okay. So, because right yeah. now you're, you're just grabbing it and going, yeah. instead of you going, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, so when you get there, you mess with it. Because okay. even if you get that moment, boom, ha ha ha, tink. Yeah, okay, so you gotta take that beat there. Great. They're both alike in dignity, but they wouldn't have the same philosophy of fighting. We weren't sure which family was gonna be which. We, initially had thought that the more circular and everything would be the Montagues and uh, Mercutio because of the mercurial uh, being more like Mercury um, and the way Mab kind of flows as an aria and we wanted to go that way and we thought of the way Tybalt is just there's Romeo everything he does is very direct but we didn't want to force that on the artists uh, we wanted to find out how they moved and we were incredibly fortunate that that's actually how they ended up moving So the world isn't a sword fight, it's the fight between these two families and their point of view. We need to pivot 180. Oh, okay. <laughs> long feet are here, because they're headed this end. So let's come up and get the drop here. Yes, around. Turn. Josh, pivot where you are. Keep pivoting, so Josh, stay on this side. Not you. They just drop her off. Well, okay, they're going up. <laughs> Katura and myself, at the same time in different times, have been able to help move the bodies around the space, uh, sometimes for safety reasons, sometimes for aesthetic. Um, oftentimes I, I end up working as a style coordinator and just as a basic movement coach uh, for singers. Sometimes it's how to stand or how to bow or how to give a reverence in the style that, or in the period in which they are, are playing. Sometimes it's as much as just uh, showing them how to walk in their dress or with a cape, um, how to lift somebody into their arms, how to fall, which is what um, Dale, the fight choreographer, and I were working on with um, David Adam Moore. You stumble forward this way, you can go all the way down. Down. No, you're fine. Yeah, exactly. And then you're there. And it's all the soft parts of your body. So you've taken yeah. your thigh, your button, and then all the way to your back. One more time, just slow, guys. And just think, even though you don't have a certain head, knowing you drop it, you can say drop. Yeah. Get that in part of the whole mannerism. Yeah, I wanted to just practice the fall part first and then. Well, I don't, I'm not saying, but know where this is happening, even though you're not doing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's great, that's great. Mercutio is, uh, he's very, very florid. We've worked in lots and lots of circular movements and kind of, you know, beautiful swishy things and stuff like that. He's really, really flashy, but not terribly disciplined. 
At the moment I'm stabbed, for me that's the first moment that I'm completely honest. Because the rest of the time it's a facade, the rest of the time it's, it's an act, I'm always reacting to other people and trying to, to get them going and yank their chain. And At the very end when I'm stabbed, I finally look at Romeo and Tybalt in the eye and I say, you know, may, may a plague be on both of your houses. There's little I hate more about opera productions than when the stage combat and when the stage deaths are badly done. So I've been really lucky to have, um, to, to have number one, the time in rehearsal to work this death scene out, and, and number two, to have this many people whose opinions I completely trust. I mean, being in good physical condition certainly helps, and this is a fairly athletic cast. I mean, they're, they're all in pretty good shape. But it's about the breath, and uh, Karen has been very gracious in, in working to find the right tempo. I mean, this is a great role because you get to sing some really great music, you get some high notes, you got a great bunch of duels, and you get to die. I mean, it's great. This Romeo and Juliet is so much about the duplicity of love versus the impossibility of fate. Um, and I think that we've come at it with fresh eyes and, and really an open heart about the way that we, you know, that we deal with this production. So in addition to you know, the fact that the dances are great and the fights are great and the singing is great and the staging should be great, I think that uh, I think it, it reminds us that this story is still very immediate and important to all of us as humans.